Hi, everyone, and welcome to a very special conversation with the writers of Avatar The Way of Water. I'm Eric Davis, and I'm very excited to dive in and get our feet wet and use a number of other water puns as we learn more from the elite team of writers tasked with a seemingly impossible mission to not just create a sequel to the highest grossing film of all time, but also to be the masterminds behind an entire series of films. So let's jump into the deep end and introduce our guests beginning with the director, writer, producer, and editor of Avatar The Way of Water, James Cameron, and co-writers Amanda Silva, Rick Jaffa, Shane Salerno, and Josh Friedman. Welcome, everyone. How's it going? Um, so first off, before we, we get started, I, I just wanted to shout out a couple of stats. Uh, you know, as we sit here today, uh, the Way of Water has grossed over $1.5 billion worldwide. It is the number one film of 2022. It is also the most successful part two ever. Uh, in fact, Avatar and Avatar The Way of Water are the only part one and part two of a franchise to have grossed that much money globally. And so just a hearty congratulations to all of you for making history and delivering a picture beloved by audiences around the world. Congratulations to you. Framing it that way just makes my day. <laughs> there are other stats there too, but those are just the top level stuff. And it just really is amazing. And you know, Jim, um, before you even assembled this team of writers, there was a significant amount of work that you had done. And I've, I've heard of binders and hundreds of pages of notes. I believe a Pandorapedia is how it's been referenced. And so- No, those are two different things. Oh, okay. Uh, but to start- Which I can explain if you'd like. Uh, yeah, a bit of a bit of a fun question. I mean, how did that material come together? And and did you have a room that you went to uh, where you were scrolling all of this stuff down? But talk about you know how long it took you to amass that that much material and how how that came together for you. Well, I I knew I wanted to put together a writing room, you know, because I'd had such a good experience on on the creation of Dark Angel, which was my only experience to date with episodic TV. Um, but I, I really like the process of just having a creative, a creative space with, with cool, creative individuals. Uh, but I figured that I needed to get, I need to get a foothold in the world. I, I, I didn't want us to just start with a completely kind of blank page. So I spent about four or five months in, in the, uh, back half of 2012. Actually, no, it was more of the first half of 2013. Just write, just jotting notes. I mean, to me, look, there's nothing more daunting than a than a, a blank screen. I think we all feel that. So, you know, there's there's you know, you you read books written by writers on how they process, and they just drive themselves, they just lash themselves across the back to to write something every day. So I thought oh, I'll just start writing. I'll just start writing. It can be anything, you know, just any random thought about the characters or the world creatures and you know then after a while it starts to take on a direction so i think when i showed up with the with our team which was in guys you remember was it july of 13 i think you're rick i think you're muted no no he's just doing I'm that just, he's just i'm not just doing speaking. my best veto corleone no you gotta speak up <laughs> <laughs> okay. Old, so. it, 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 anyway, so that's when I showed up with a bunch of notes, but they were notes specific to whatever the new saga would be, however movies. It was conceived initially as a trilogy of new films. So Pandorapedia is something else. Pandorapedia was also a reference point for the writing team, but Pandorapedia was, was already a document that had been in progress for years at that point, and it was a collation of all the world-building thinking that went into, you know, the Alpha Centauri solar system, the names of all the planets and the moons and their sizes and their gravitational fields and the, the gas composition of the Pandoran atmosphere and the atmospheres of the other moons, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, just infinite detail on the plant species and the animal species and all that done ad nauseum to the point that, you know, you, you that, you know, I mean, any mega nerd can go and find out anything about, about Pandora from Pandorapedia. But that was already, I, I want to say like 450 or 500 pages, and it was all online. It was all available to anybody. But the note, the notes, I don't remember how, but it was like a couple of binders full of notes on, on like undersea life and things like that. It had a lot of directionality in terms of the story, 
but but it was a little sparse on detail. There was a little pesky, you know, problem of plot that we had to work out. So I talk about assembling this team though. Why why this team? Um, I don't know. They were available. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I can't remember, but we talked, right? I mean, I think everybody came in and we talked and just blue skied a little bit, right? Yeah, kind of. It wasn't really an audition, but it it was a let's just sure sit down and talk about. It was an audition. <laughs> and, uh, we talked process. I think a lot. We talked process and kind of how yeah. we, it was much more of a process than a like we didn't talk avatar as much as we talked how it would work and kind of our previous, you know, I mean, I had experience doing TV and film. Shane had done TV as well. Rick and Amanda hadn't done TV, but had done obviously a bunch of film stuff. So I think, you know, we definitely talked. Uh, yeah, I think, look, that's a critical factor. So Josh, you'd, you'd been a showrunner on several shows, including uh, the the uh, Sarah, Sarah Connor Chronicles, right? And Shane, you'd been a showrunner and writer on a number of shows. And, and but Rick and Amanda, you guys had done had, had done series features in, with the Apes, right. the Apes yeah, franchise, we, right? Yeah. So it was that, that that idea of how do you build a saga over time? How do you know where to button off an individual you know episode, um, and and carry forward? How do you how do you lay seeds for what the next chapter is going to be and all that sort of thing? So I think you can see a pattern here, Eric, in terms yeah. of how we put the team together. Yeah, without a doubt, you know, and, and Amanda, Rick, Shane, Josh, you know, you, you've all worked on, on big successful movies too. You know what a hit looks like, you know what it feels like. Um, and I'm curious too, when, when Jim approached each of you, what was the thing that he said or the thing that you saw that convinced you that this was a journey that you were destined to go on with him? And you know, Amanda, I'll, I'll start with you. Well, I mean, we had loved, I had loved Avatar so much. And um, I, I was, I, I've said this before, but I was daunted to go on this journey, but really challenged to, to do it. I mean, how, how to do uh, follow-up movies to Avatar that could, could build on the world and, and, uh, and be as engaging. I mean, it's, it's just the bar was super high, yeah. but it was very exciting. Yeah, I, think, I think for us, well, I think for us too, it was, I remember we, when we left the meeting with Jim, I remember Amanda saying, wow, this would be the greatest adventure. I mean, this would just be a spectacular adventure. And so that was for us, the opportunity to work with Jim, go on this grand adventure and, and then work with other writers, which we hadn't really done. And, uh, and we were, we were always wanted to do that and really interested in doing that. And, and, you know, just to remind everybody, Jim's a great writer. You know, so so we knew we were getting to room with, you know, wonderful writers and we were hoping the chemistry would be great. And we'd just go on this great adventure with everybody. My experience was um, was a little unusual because I was I was when they first approached me, I had just come off of working uh, for for Jim and John on a remake of Fantastic Voyage, uh, sort of in partnership with Rick and Amanda. And um, I had loved that experience, but I had not really gotten a lot of, of, of time with Jim at, for that particular project. And so sitting down with him was, was really cool because the idea that you wanted to follow up the most successful movie of all time with multiple films was, uh, was just an incredible idea. And um, I expressed my concern that uh, I remember bringing up The Matrix 2 and 3 where, where people's expectations were you know of a certain level that were not met and that that was that was a big fear of mine and I remember saying to Jim um I think this second film has to be as big of a jump as Star Wars was to the Empire Strikes Back and he got this smile on his face like I'm ahead of you you know <laughs> and uh and so one of the things that was so unique about this experience was working with this group of people, you know, because one day John Landau said to me that they had cast all the writers, which I thought was an interesting term. Uh, what was unique about the room was that the two most two things that were most unique about the room for me were that Jim Cameron and all that comes with Jim Cameron became Jim the writer in the room. He, he literally, I don't know how he did it, but he was one of us. He was not, we were not writers just pitching this 
director of the two highest grossing films of all time. We were writers who could say to him, that's a good idea, that's a bad idea, here's why. We never had anything weird or political with this group, which is so unusual. We never had it, you know, it was just an exceptional group of people that I was, I was privileged to be part of. But I want to tell you one last thing. While I was on Fantastic Voyage, John Landau said, come down to Lightstorm one day. This is when Lightstorm was in Santa Monica, had their own building and a movie theater in the, in the lobby. And he said, I want to show you nine scenes from Avatar. And so the first time I saw Avatar was about six, eight months before the world saw it. I saw these nine scenes and I thought it was the most extraordinary thing I'd ever seen in my life. So to go from that screening room to being hired to work with this exceptional group of people was incredible, you know? Um, I remember about two weeks, a couple of weeks ago, sitting on the stage at the Writers Guild with this, with this group of writers and just thinking, when I became a member of the Writers Guild, if you told me I'd have been on stage with Jim Cameron talking about co-writing a sequel to the, you know, highest grossing movie, I mean, you know, dream big, hope for it and do good work and, and hopefully surround yourself with great people. That's awesome. Yeah. And I mean, it paid off. It's, it is the, the biggest part two uh, ever uh, as we sit here. And Josh, I, you talk about what your experience was like coming into this and, and uh, was it similar? I just needed a job. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, ever the pragmatist. <laughs> uh, well, no. I mean, gosh, you were you were comfortable with science fiction. You love science fiction. Yeah. You no, I, I felt in your wheelhouse. Yeah. It, it all felt in my. I mean, it, it felt it felt it all felt very in my wheelhouse. I mean, in the sense that I'd done science fiction both in features and in TV. I had, you know, run rooms. I had engaged in Jim's canon previously, you know, by doing the Terminator stuff. Although at that moment, at the point Jim and I met was the first time Jim and I met and we had never spoken about Terminator. I had no idea what he said. We still about. haven't talked about it. <laughs> <laughs> we, well, you know, do you know, I mean, this is a whole other I'm thing. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Well, but do you know when we ended up, do you know the first time we ever talked about it? Was on, on uh, Dark, Dark what Fate. became Dark Fate. So we went the entire number of years during Avatar, never talking about Terminator, about the fact that I had done it. And I just, and it was, and I was like, well, I'm not going to bring it up, you know, and. Well, it just wasn't I, relevant, but, but yeah. I have to say, and this is a good time to get some of this stuff out, that because I followed it, I didn't watch every episode religiously, but I followed it enough to know that you were you were good. You were adept at taking ideas, thematic ideas that, that came from the original movie and twisting and turning them in ways that stayed within the guardrails of that universe and were surprising in a pleasing way, which is really the art of the sequel, right? The art of the sequel is to stay straight, stay true to the true believers, but still twist and turn it and and refract it back on itself and do unexpected things. So I thought, okay, well here's a dem here's a here's a demonstration before the fact that Josh knows how to do this stuff. It was I, I remember you and I sat down. And the two things I remember that stuck out to me about the process, just about the, that part of the process was, is that they asked. Jim and John, or I mean, I asked to read my draft of War of the Worlds, not the movie and not the shooting draft or whatever, because I've been, you know, David Kemp would come on after me or whatever. No one had ever asked for, and as far as I know, read my drafts of War of the Worlds, because at the time when I wrote them, they were NDA'd and no one could read them and they were just there. And then at some point, you know, I, I left and Kemp came on and that was the movie that was made. And no one really thinks about it. like it just and i remember getting a phone call you know from my agent and they said they want to read your draft of war of the worlds and i thought these people are doing a deep like they're doing the deep dive that one should do when they're doing like it's yeah, i read it i read it i really liked it i thought that they would have been well served if they had saved at least some of the ideas and set pieces more than they more than they did well i appreciate that and, you know it's the classic thing that another writer comes on and then feels like they have to make every single scene their own and they wind up throwing out way more than they than they wisely should have. <clears throat> I, I remember that. And then I remember we were sitting in your office 
and um, you said, you pointed behind me and go, this was as close as we ever got to talk about Terminator. You went, oh, you'd appreciate this. And I turned around and it was the original model for the Terminator, you know, stop motion. Yeah, model, the, right? the stop motion model. Yeah. Stop motion model from Terminator was sitting behind me the whole time that we were meeting. And I looked and it was back, like looking over my shoulder and I'm walking out. I'm like, yeah, I want to fucking do this. <laughs> this is, I want to be here. Like, There's a funny are, story about that I, model. It, it got stolen out of my office when I had an office on the lot at Fox. And we responded by firing the entire security staff at 20th Century Fox Studios until it was returned. Oh my God. And it showed up in my car the next morning. Wow. Wrapped in a towel. Oh my God. And then everybody got to come back to work. Josh, how did you get it back in his car? So, so you know. So you're all you're all working together now. What what did an average day look like inside this writer's room? Um, I mean, was it a nine to five? And and what was there, what was taking there place? Was, the um, there was a hard time uh, to show up, and there was um, kind of a very cool ten to fifteen minute sort of fifteen minutes. It's a rule. Yeah, it's a bylaw. Yeah, you which was got great. a bullshit and tell jokes for fifteen minutes. Yeah, which for a long time uh, uh, entailed me listening to all of them talk about the Game of Thrones that had aired the night before <laughs> um, and and having not watched it yet and just hearing, oh my God, Fred is dead. And you, could you believe they killed Fred or whatever? Um, and, and then we would, without missing a beat, we would just dive in and start talking about the ideas. The room was unique in that there was a person taking a, a virtual transcription of every, uh, thing that was said and keeping detailed daily notes. We would exchange ideas until lunch. Um, what was unique about the situation for me and I think for the other writers working with a director is normally when you work with a director, you're interrupted four or five times, assistants are coming in, not the way Jim works. Uh, it was, it, that room was locked off. People weren't allowed in it. And it really was kind of a sanctuary for ideas on the walls, on every wall uh, were, um, boards with with detailed um, descriptions of scenes and uh, set pieces and ideas. Um, those boards grew as time went on. There were some incredible screens around the table that had featured some of the work um, that was being done or some designs had been done either from the first film or the, the new series. And the coolest thing was above us was the art department. And so if Rick and Amanda or Josh came up with some great idea, uh, then the next day or three days later, there might be a drawing or a, or a rendering of that artwork that you could actually see. So there was this incredible process where we were feeding them and they were feeding us. Um, upstairs was the most incredible room where every, every wall was covered with uh, kind of ideas and vision uh, images. Um, and, uh, and then we would break for lunch uh, usually we would break as writers and then come back in the afternoon and start all over again until the end of the day. I, awesome. I really believe in surrounding, surrounding ourselves with a feeling of progress and, and creativity. So the art department was actually the entire floor of the building, but directly above us, right up the stairwell was the sort of the gallery part where it was literally just several rooms, uh, walled and corkboard where they they'd put up the art with big prints right so it was it was just a kind of visual feast to go through there as the as the art developed so we're literally downstairs trying to you know trying to visualize these scenes while upstairs they're they're bringing the scenes to to life and it, you know uh, like Shane was saying it was a feedback loop but we also surrounded ourselves with whiteboards and every day when you came in you'd look at the progress right I think we spent an awful lot of, I mean, our whiteboard time was more about structure and our dialogue time was more obviously character and emotion and kind of, and then we'd get an idea and then we'd try to figure out structurally where it fit. And, and I, it should be pointed out that I refused to, the first question everybody asked me that's on the call was, which one is mine? Which one am I writing? And that was the last question I answered at the end of the six month process. Cause I knew that if I said, you know, Shane was going to do a movie too, 
he would tune out whenever we started talking about movie three. But since it was an uncollapsed superposition, everybody was equally invested in the whole, the greater story arc right up until the end of that, of that group process. That's uh, awesome. And I, how did we do the, I mean, I, I remember the selection process for who, who got which script involved you guys sort of putting in your bid for, I like this one and, and like a, what do you call it? A preferential voting kind of ballot. Yeah, there was a ranked. Yeah. Was that? Ranked. It was a ranked voting, but then but basically Rick became, Rick was the only one who went to the Christmas party um, and uh, you did the final. I, I presented, I presented the proposal to you at the Christmas party. So I was Christmas. Uh, was I about eight drinks in? Yeah. Because uh, we call that only after movie. only after I told you what we all wanted. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it was. I don't know. It was. It was easy, but we 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 spent time talking about it. The, the four of us about which movies that we would want to do and why, and we talked about it some more, and then uh, and then I kind of went off with the list to the party. But had we done the treatments by then? Yeah. yeah. Yes. We did them as we went along, they kind of piecemeal, and then they kind of got unraveled and rewritten a couple of times, as I recall. And the treatments were interesting because everybody had their own selected font that they liked. So when you read the treatment, it always looked like this total mashup, you know, like there's Rick and Amanda's paragraph. <laughs> Here's my paragraph, you know, somebody like Courier. <laughs> Right. See? The idea of, um, of, of how, how much it kind of cross contaminated, you know, uh, Rick and Amanda did the treatment for the film that I ended up writing. I ended up writing the, so the treatment, I think, for two. Josh ended up work. So everybody participated in everybody's movie without knowing what was the, the final movie. What's right. amazing about that is while all the movies are inherently Jim and the, the 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 you know right through the DNA of every one of them the 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 um, films each match our personalities in really interesting ways as well. I mean I I don't think that I would have been the right primary writer for two and three what became two and three. Um, so I think that's that's interesting that it, it it ended up ultimately aligning with our with us as well. That's yeah. awesome. You know. I I, I, you know, I know we work, you guys worked on, on multiple movies at once, but it really does feel too like the most, one of the most important things was act one of the way of water. You know, this is our re-entry into the world 13 years later. There's a number of new characters to introduce, and that really is the gateway to everything else. And I'm just curious how difficult or perhaps easy was it to crack act one? It was one. the hardest fucking thing I've ever done. I don't know about you guys. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, we spent a lot of time breaking story across, and we always did it across all three movies. Anything that we did in act two of movie, what we thought of as movie two would somehow resonate with act three of movie three or act, you know, act two of movie four, whatever it was. We were making two, three, and four at, at that time. So, and it was all up on whiteboards and the whiteboards got stacked over each other so we could slide them away and see what we had done before. It, it was, Kind of crazy, but act act one of movie two was a bitchosaurus rex. I mean, it really was. What we had too many ideas. If I if I could if I could go back in a time machine and advise us as a group, I'd I'd say get start lightening the dirigible. We're going down, you know. But we had too many ideas to service and too much backstory. So there was the problem of recapitulating movie one. For an audience we knew was going to be years apart from having seen it there was the problem of then somehow addressing the 15 years <clears throat> in between movie one and where the new movie starts because we wanted to tell this story of teenage kids so we knew there was a 14 15 year jump for a while we noodled around with this idea that we'd have accelerate that we'd have navi kids develop faster so it was only 10 years <clears throat> Ultimately, we abandoned that because it was ultimately meaningless. They're teenagers. So that amount of time has gone by. Um, and then there was a problem of kickstarting the story to get the Sullys out of the jungle 
and to the reef because we knew that was the goal. So the goal was to be at the reef by the end of act one. And it's like, man, talk about 10 pounds of shit in a three pound bag. So we had all these great ideas for all the things we wanted in act one, but when we actually wrote it out, it was like a hundred pages. So, you know, we didn't want to make, you know, a movie quite that long. Uh, plus we wanted to get to the ocean. So, but it, one, of the, one of the problems is there was a major thing that happens to the character of Spider, and I don't want to say what it is, but the, but the breakthrough came when we pulled that raw and bleeding out of act one of movie two and dropped it into act one of movie three oh. and just made it its own thing. And then all of a sudden it got quite clear what to do. Opening montage, Jake tells you everything you need to do. You need to know four and a half minutes, boom, humans come back. Two minutes, wanton destruction. And then you're at minute six and the story starts. So, but it wasn't, it certainly wasn't clear to us. We, we were, we were kind of having too much fun in a way. We loved our care. We fell in love with our characters, you know, and that's, that's a good place to be, but then you've got to kind of lay a framework over it. Yep. And there were so many dynamics to set up. It's not just that you're setting up, you know, how Kiri came to be and how she became to be adopted by the Sullies, but it's Kiri's relationship with Spider, Kiri's relationship with Neytiri, Kiri's relationship with her mom, you know, her birth mom in the in the tank, you know, uh, relationship with Awa, you know, there are all these things. The relationship to between the brothers and that dynamic. So and, even yeah. if you take Loa. And, you know, and Spider and Quaritch. Uh, and Jake and Loak, you know, we had all these axes between characters that had to be had to be serviced that all they all pay off across the whole saga. But you've got to I always I always believe you, you kind of make an opening statement about what the character's problems are, some kind of opening statement. And so we're trying to do too many opening statements. So I think we eventually kind of solved it. But it's, it it's much more complicated than it seems is the thing. Yeah, it's yeah. harder and it's hard to do. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, one of the things about Jim's movies is that, you know, a lot of times it, it makes it, it looks like it's so simple to do, but it's not. And the genius is making it look like it's simple to do. And uh, well, the, the other big thing was taking out the space battle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there was yeah. a giant space <laughs> battle. We took it out. <laughs> Remember the space I'll, I'll tell you, those moments you know, when you, you are in space are, are really cool and really visceral. So, you know, yeah. uh, it, it was really cool, That's that stuff. We just put the space battle later. You know, it's like you got a big enough canvas, you got an idea, it's, it's going to go somewhere. I love that. I love that space battle. It was hard to let go, but it was required, but it was like. Yeah. But, you know, the, re the real reason the space battle came, because uh, ultimately we wound up, we could have taken what we, everything we had created for act one and made it an entire movie. In fact, I even did the experiment. I took everybody's scenes and all my scenes and everybody else's scenes and shoved them all together into a script, which, which ultimately I, I called the high ground and we're doing it as a, a graphic novel. But the high ground was a 125 page script that had a beginning, middle and an end. It would have made a great movie. But it wasn't the movie we were trying to make. It never, it never, it made it to the ocean on like page 110. You know, wasn't doing the job. Because we knew the ocean was what people were going to want to see. That was the new thing. So the high ground became this kind of weird cul-de-sac. People have said that we kind of wrote a script and abandoned it, but, it, but that's not really what happened. We were, we were all working ahead in our areas, but I, I just was sitting there one day and I said, all right, I'm going to take five days and just jam all these scenes together and see what happens. And it turned into a script. It was like it could, it literally could have been the first Avatar, I mean, the first sequel. But we rejected it. And I want to go back to the very first stage of our process, which was to figure out what worked in the first movie. And, the, you know, there's the plot and there's the character and all that. And there's the thematic stuff around the environment. But then there was another kind of spiritual component and a kind of a dreamlike wonder. And it took us a few days to kind of be able to quantify that in some way that was going to guide us and the high ground didn't hit those metrics it didn't hit the spiritual and the and the dreamlike wonder components but we always felt awesome secure that the ocean would. you remember that 
Yes, but it had some awesome stuff in it. I mean, it, it really, it, 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 it really had some remarkable. I mean, listen, Avatar was, you know, normally all of us have worked with, you know, directors and, and normally when you have a great idea, you pitch it to a director, particularly a director who's not a writer. They go, great, put it in, you know, you know, that's not how Avatar worked. A great idea was just the start of a process. I have never worked on any film or television or book where the uh, vetting of every idea was as rigorous as it was here. Uh, ideas would be discussed for two or three days and seemed like they were unequivocally going to be in only to be cut out because it didn't work. Um, Jim's process is unlike anyone else's that I've, that I've ever seen and it, his standard is higher. And uh, a good idea alone is not enough. And so it was interesting in a room atmosphere to see ideas um, be developed and built upon um, and, and brought to the level that would be um, where they could actually be incorporated into a story. Because remember, at that point, we were doing three movies, three became four. But I don't think what audiences understand today is I think people think they've seen Avatar 2. They've really seen Avatar 1.5 because there's, there's a whole second film, a third film that is really the completion of the second film. Um, so it's not as simple as like Star Wars, Empire, Return. It's, it's a much more dense and complex and rich uh, storytelling that's, that's ahead. I mean, we, are, we have the great fortune of knowing what's in three, four and five, and they are as unique and different and incredible as two is to one. I can't wait to see them, man. They're going to be so cool. <laughs> well, there's ideas that we've, that are so old hat to us, we've forgotten about them that we haven't even shot yet, you know, but uh, there's stuff coming up that's pretty, pretty damn exciting. I mean, there's the interesting thing is that Josh is, sorry, go ahead, Josh. Oh, I was just going to say, there's some stuff in the script that I got to write that is, uh, you know, that we put in there that's just fucking awesome. Like, I love the stuff that's in there. That's, it's just, you know, this anyway, it's exciting. Did I tell you, did I tell you Emma Watts reaction when, when uh, that script script went in? Because by then I was submitting them in the in in like we'd already decided to split into into four films. So, you know, she got two. I got four pages of notes. She got three. I got a page and a half of notes. She got four, which is which is Josh's film and i got an email that said holy fuck <laughs> <laughs> so i sent her an email that said where's the notes and she sent back those are the notes <laughs> so i think we can call that a shooting shooting draft <laughs> it's, it's and i haven't even turned five in yet you know can i go back to what shane was talking about just a second though in terms of the room uh, and the ideas and, 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 uh, you know, there was, and, you know, Jim set the tone for this, but there was this, I may have said this the other night, we were tireless and fearless. And I don't know if I've ever had that experience in writing. Just, we just, you know, we worked really, really hard. We showed up every day and, and, but we were fearless with some of these ideas that, you know, for, and especially, you know, with science fiction, at least for us, even though we've written a ton of science fiction, but some of it was somewhat foreign to us once we were in the, when we were in the room. And we would just go down the road and down the road and down the road. And sometimes, you know, as Shane was saying, work something, work something, work something. And every once in a while, you'd take a right turn or a left turn. And Jim was like, oh, no, no, let's go down that road. And so we would. And so we, we were, you know, we'd jump in and it was, it was, it was fun, but it was, uh, but it was also for us anyway, uh, just this incredible learning opportunity and experience. What's something from the script for The Way of Water that you put in there and it was a bit of a risk for you and you didn't, you didn't know if, if, if audiences were gonna go for it, and, but you kind of took that leap. Um, and uh, w once you saw it kind of realized in the film, it, you know, it kind of maybe surprised you. Was, was there an aspect of that script like that? Maybe Kiri's journey. I say Kiri. That was always something we were concerned about because so much of it's internal for her. 
But the yeah. other thing is the fact that Piacon talks. Oh, I mean, yeah, you know, talking whales. Talking, talking whales. whales. So there are no other animals that talk in Avatar. Like that, that was a brand new thing. And I guess that's an example of a uh, gem of your fearlessness because you were just going to go for it. You know? We always talked about Piacon as a character. Yes. It was never kind of free willy, you know, it was never kind of like the noble, the noble whale, you know, which is this kind of awesome thing that we have here on, on planet earth. But this was like a character with a backstory with trauma, with his shit that he had to work out and his reason, his reasons that drove him to a relationship with the, with the outlier, you know, the outcast kid. We just approached it like they were two teenagers, as I recall. Like, what would the dynamic be between two teens that m meet out in the woods and have find out they have something in common, right? right? I mean, and everybody talks about the the beauty of uh, of Avatar: The Way of Water, and 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 rightfully so. That grew out of writer conversations. That didn't just grow out of uh, you know uh, design department conversations. I remember. To, to, to the, uh, I think, aggravation of everyone for, I brought up this movie, The Black Stallion, about 10 times when we started. And I would just say, I was like, you know, I saw this movie, I was like eight or nine years old, and there's this kid and a horse on an island, and it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. And, you know, when I went back and watched the movie after having not seen it for years, I had forgotten that that section is a very tiny section of the movie, because he gets rescued pretty quickly and brought home. And, you know, there are five or six shots in the Black Stallion that are just stunningly beautiful. I mean, there are 50 of those shots in Avatar. Um, but, but the Black Stallion, once you brought it up, it became a real anchor point for us because it's, it's like, all right, are we really going to take a wild swing where we go completely away from Jake and Neytiri, our, found, our founding characters from the from the the highest grossing film in history and we're just going to take up a, a half hour interlude away from them and their issues and go with this kid and do the black stallion on the island except it's actually him out in the in the lagoon you know and that's a big, that's a big risk but, to take, yeah. right but we we knew we were on very solid ground thematically though i mean that was part of the conversation i think shane you're referring to but you know, to add the, the, the theme of the outsider, which, by the way, I think every teenager in the history of the planet can relate to. And uh, and these two characters, you know, are really on the same kind of emotional journey when they find each other. And it took us a while, I think, to get to that. Uh, uh, but the thing is, we were on solid ground. And so uh, and it, it did feel like a wild swing. On the other hand, it, I don't know if it did, because we just... We 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 were we believed in it, and it was fun when the when the characters of the kids started to take over a little bit in the room. I mean, they did after a while. It's just like we did. We got more interested in them. We got more interested in them, and I think we all channeled not only our parenting, except for except for Shane, but but we were all adolescent angsty adolescents at 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 some point, so we were able to channel all that. And I have to tell you how strongly that I have a weird story. The other day I was talking to a friend of mine and his teenage, uh, two teenagers saw the movie and they said, you know why we love the movie? I said, why? I thought they were going to say, you know, all the incredible. They said, because those kids talk like us. And that was a thing where, that was a pushback from the studio initially, that they, that they were two. And what Rick and Amanda and John, Rick and Amanda and, and, and uh, Jim did there was very, very risky, which was to to basically put contemporary American uh, vernacular of teenagers into the mouths of Navi, um, but only for, the kids. Yeah, only the kids for for the but for the, for these two teenagers that I was talking to, a friend of mine's kids, that was what brought them in and connected them to the whole movie that they felt represented. So that was a situation where. You know the studio and maybe other people felt like oh is this a little and it's like no that's exactly what's connecting and i i think one of the most amazing things about about what jim does is he has this very unique relationship with audiences around the world you know it, it's unlike any other filmmaker i've ever seen it's basically i'm going to go off on this journey and i'm going to make these uh, make this movie and it's going to take four years or five years or 10 years or 13 years you know and I'm going to push myself harder than anybody. I'm going to 
invent all new technology to do it. I'm going to come up with all this amazing stuff. And the audience has promised back to him is, and when you're there, when you're ready, Jim, we'll be there. We'll see you when you're ready. And that's what's powered Titanic, Avatar, and now Avatar The Way of Water. This very interesting bond that he has, not only with knowing what, what audiences want to see, but, but somehow he, he's making these incredibly personal films. I mean, every frame of this film is, if you know Jim, is, are his obsessions, are his passions. And, you know, they're done on a scale that no one else could do. But in a weird way, you know, Jim makes like incredibly expensive independent movies. <laughs> About well, part it. of it, I think, Shane, is the is dynamic range, right? So you can't do the big scale if you don't do the intimacy. Right. Right. So, you know, one of the things, I mean, if you go in to write an epic, it's going to feel like an epic in every frame. And people are going to talk like it's some mythopoetic epic sort of thing. And, I, I, you know, I didn't want to do that. I wanted it to be little and tiny and personal when it was little and tiny and personal. I wanted it to be as big as you could imagine when we want to do that. But, you know, it's, it's like using the whole spectrum of light, all the colors. It's like using the full spectrum of human experience. And yeah. I think we all got into that groove fairly, fairly early on. Um, and everybody brought little anecdotal textural things from their own lives to the, to the table. I mean, the one thing I think we've been, we've been saying, I just want to say it in my way, is that it was a safe, creative space. Any idea could be could be vetted, you know. And sometimes it'd be like we'd be charging along, and somebody'd say something, and we'd all just stop and turn and go, "Fuck yeah!" <laughs> and then we'd run with that for a while. And Shane had this remarkable capability to just stop the train cold and go, "All right, guys, you're you're running along telling this whole thing, but I think you're forgetting something really important," you know. And then. You know, he'd turn into some, you know, you know, like narco proceduralist, you know, <laughs> kind of kind of guy that just wanted to see people getting capped, you know, and be like, well, yeah, we got to have that too, Shane. <laughs> <laughs> Whose idea was it? To, to, who figured out Quaritch? How to bring Quaritch back? I mean, this is a character that died in the first film. Who who yeah. cracked that one? We're all we're all good with sci-fi. We know that until your DNA is expunged from the universe, you could still come back. Yeah, I've never the idea of, of how important the art department was. In two seconds, like when we first heard the idea of Sigourney Weaver. I mean, I wish you, I wish there could have been a camera at the lunch that Rick, Amanda, and Josh and I were at a couple of hours later. They're like, we were looking at each other, like, wait, Sigourney, wait, what, what? Sigourney is who? And then, and then a couple of days later, Jim came and, and tacked onto the wall a picture of her as the character. I mean, it was Orny's face, but on the, you know, in the Navi. And everybody, I remember Amanda and Rick and Josh were like, no, no, it could work. Yeah, no, that, that could work. <laughs> I think that there's a, like broadly, maybe we've kind of said it, but you know, because I've run rooms before, and so I'm very conscious of room dynamics and, you know, and how fragile they are, really. It can be. Like, one asshole really can ruin a whole thing. And I, and I do think that rooms develop value systems, you know? I mean, they develop kind of moral cores that are both, that are aesthetic moral cores, you know, and aesthetic value systems. And I think that that's, out of that can grow something like this but i think that and that starts with jim you know and i think all the different things we're saying which is like like jim's level of creative endurance his ability to go off and he says throw together a bunch of scenes he didn't throw together a bunch of scenes he wrote a script like there's a script there that's not just a, it's not a hodgepodge he came in there's we don't know i don't know another we've all worked with with big directors whatever i don't know another person who who is as rigorous in their process and as indefatigable uh in their creativity as jim like so it's 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 you cannot the, the value system of that room was we are going to get it right you know and we're and it's and we're gonna and and it's going to come from the heart you know and it's not yes people are going to get capped and there's going to be whatever and the fucking fisherman's going to get his arm torn off 
And, you know, like, which I, I had a fourth grader and a sixth grader over at my house yesterday, a friend of mine brought their two kids and they had just seen it the day before. And their eyes were just on fire. And I was like, what was your favorite part? And they are like, they literally, what was it? When the fisherman got his arm torn off. That was what the fourth grader said to me. And I was like, yeah, it's pretty awesome, isn't it? And, you know, but to be able to do the high and the low, the big and the small, you need to have a guiding compass, you know, a value system. And, and that was imbued in us over time, but relatively quickly. And that's how you get a safe space that's that productive. And I've been in a lot of rooms. I've run a lot of rooms. And I've never been in one that was able to attack these problems at this level with this kind of rigor it was kind of a miracle you know and the conversation never stopped though i remember about four o'clock in the afternoon i got these guys hooked on a green smoothie <laughs> which we jokingly called the ewa libra <laughs> <laughs> and uh every afternoon around four or five o'clock we'd get up from the working table walk away from the whiteboards and we'd go over and just sit around a little circle kind of like this little den and we just have our ewa libra and we just spitball just ideas or sometimes the conversation would just continue, but it, it was suddenly like taking the straps off of a sense of discipline and having to write everything down and, you know, and just kind of just talk. And it was, uh, some of our best ideas came out of that. Uh, and, and Danny, our, the writer's assistant was taking notes while we were all sitting around doing that too. So. Which would be what? issued the next day, by the way, every day you got a copy of yes pages yeah that's that's awesome you know and as, as we begin to to wrap up uh you know you're all veterans you've all worked on hits before uh but you know how i'd just be curious to quickly hear from each of you like just how this experience has now changed you as an artist moving forward shane i'll start with you well i mean i just became a better writer working with this group of people I, I i became a better writer working with jim there's this documentary on brian wilson of the beach boys uh when he did pet sounds and uh, there's this moment where jimmy buffett is is sitting in a studio with him and jimmy buffett goes sees brian wilson make this little turn on a dial on the board and he says i waited 25 years to figure out what that trick was he does on every song so we were privileged to be in a room with Jim to learn how he does this. For me, the greatest gift that we got, or at least I got from it, was Jim's standard. Um, tell you a funny story. After Avatar, I got a big job and I, I, I quit after a month. And they called the studio called and said, why, why did you quit? And I said, because that guy thinks he's Jim Cameron. And I just worked with Jim Cameron for two years and he's not Jim Cameron. And and all I can say is that his his love and his passion for movies and uh, the drive that he has and how he pushes himself every day and 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 gets the best out of if you have, if you talk to anybody who's worked with Jim in any department they'll tell you they did the best work they ever did of their careers with him and and that's that's because of how he works. And I was I was blessed to be part of this, blessed to become friends with with Rick, Amanda, and Josh. I learned so much from Josh. I sat next to him every day. I learned so much from Rick and Amanda, and uh, I, I'm a better writer for it. And I I walked away from this experience with friends that you know I have for life. Yeah, Josh. Final words. Same for you. I think that you know I learned that. Well, I, I, it confirmed some things that I always hoped were true, which is you, you can't or shouldn't write science fiction without emotion, mm -hmm. you know. And I think that that emotion and character always led the day uh, in the room, which was something that you know I tried to put in Sarah Connor or whatever it was. But I think that seeing it in Jim and seeing that at, like you know, if anyone's if people ask me all the time, well, what did you learn or what was the what was the trick? And I was just like, the trick is there's no one like him. And I'm I'm at peace knowing that I can't be him and I don't need to be him. I can just be me. But that um, the earnest application of emotion in a story is nothing to be embarrassed about. And I think that a lot of writers, screenwriters, I should say, especially sci-fi writers, 
uh, either think they're too smart for emotion or too cool for it or too cynical or maybe they don't access it well. There's an, you know, the, I think that because one of the things I asked everybody is to just be earnest. Just go, just go straight at the emotion. Don't, don't try to be cutesy. Avatar wears its heart on its sleeve and so does, so do the new films. But I think we all brought the emotion of our own, of our lives to it. You know, Rick and Amanda, you guys as parents and, you know, the stuff you've been through, the stuff I've been through, Josh, the stuff, you know, even, even with, with, you know, your, your son, uh, not that it was probably, but you, you know what the dynamic is, you know, um, and we all, we all brought emotion to it. And I think we led with that. I think there was, there was, there were two things that gave us confidence. I think one is anything we came up with from an emotional standpoint, we could, we knew because of those guys upstairs, we could make it look spectacular. You know what I mean? So we didn't have to go at spectacle. We had to go at character. And I think the other thing that gave us confidence was we weren't just writing the sequel to the biggest movie in history. We were starting a saga. Yeah. So by always looking past the thing that's right in front of you, it kind of takes the pressure off that thing that's right in front of you in a way. I mean, later, you know, we had to deal with the fact that we had to make a great movie or we didn't get to make those other, those other movies. But I think thinking across that greater story arc gave us the confidence to write an Avatar 2. In a, in a weird way. At least it worked that way for me. I don't know about you guys. And uh, Rick and Amanda, I'd, I'd like to, to kind of finish with you. I mean, what, you know, I know you did a lot of work on that Way of Water script. I mean, as you know, your biggest takeaway, something that you're most proud of now that it's out in the world and, and very successful. What would that, what would that be? Well, I just really want to say that I, I agree with what everyone else has said in terms of being, that I have so much gratitude for what I learned in the room and the, the partnership. Um, but uh, it kind of confirmed for me what, what Jim was just saying, which is that when you lead with your heart, people respond, that's, that's what people want. And I think it takes a lot of courage. It just takes guts to not be cynical, to not, to not worry about what's cool or not cool. And I think the response is a great confirmation uh, of that point of view. So yeah, I, don't and I would just no, it's okay. I I would just add that we were emotionally honest with each other in the room. So I mean, I love your question about courage. The answer is Jim. Okay, he was his is his idea, but the, I I would be more interested in the question about you know uh, the emotion of the relationships between the characters. And very early on, uh, I forgot what, I don't, I can't remember what it was, but we were talking about some character thing. And I could tell that Jim was touched emotionally by, by whatever came up in the room. I mean, I could tell, and I, I, we didn't know Jim very well that early on, but I thought, holy shit. If, I mean, if Jim's going to show that kind of uh, honesty on an emotional level, talking about these characters, and then we certainly not only can, but should. And so I, I I agree, and I agree with what everyone said. I, look, it we're we're far better writers today than we were when we started, and uh, and we've learned from everybody else. And and again, I you know we feel very close to everybody, you know, to Jim and Shane and Josh, and I uh, and we went through something together. Um, but to be specific, I you know I've thought about this. There were just lots of little things that we learned from Jim. One, just tiny little things that you wouldn't think would matter, but matter. For example, you came in early, Jim, and said, you know, I think it's important when we create a character that we name them right away. Give them a name right away. Suddenly they're they're they they're on the road to being fully fleshed. They're not yet. They're on the they're on their way. And so Jim, a lot of times would come into the room and say, okay, this is a character that I've been thinking about. Her name is blank, or the name is this, the name is that. And a lot of these characters, you know, had names. So that's just a tiny little thing that may not seem to matter for writers at, at our level, if you will, but it's it's really important. So there's that little thing like that, lots and lots of little things like that. Yeah, but awesome. and I go back to this tireless and fearless and you know, we just finished the script uh, just before Christmas. And I tell you, man, we were really hard on ourselves. We were like, wait a minute, this this isn't working. We know it's not working. We're not going to cover that. We're not going to 
put something under the rug or, or brush it aside or, you know, put a Band-Aid on it. And Like, what would Jim do? Like, yeah, and we do ask ourselves sometimes, or what, what would go down? If we were in the room, what would we be talking about right now? And, it, you know, oh, we worked on Apes together. I mean, Rick, you know, Rick and Amanda and I worked on Planet of the Apes together, and we were able to, you know, I think, one, we all had, three of us kind of had a, not a shorthand of language, but a shorthand of standard, you know, that we had brought, that we had brought from, from that room that was driving, would also drive us crazy if we felt other people on the project weren't where we wanted them to be. And it would be like, you know, we get notes or whatever from a director or whatever it was. And then the three of us would go on a Zoom call, like, okay, now let's figure out how we make it great. You know, like, let's, like, we're going to make it better than that because that's what we've become accustomed to doing. You know, I mean, it's just, um, and you think you, you know, it's kind of like you thought you were writing at a particular level. You thought you knew what you were doing. And then you realized, no, there was this whole other place you could go. Jim, I'd love to give you the final world word and just in terms of how this process changed you as an artist. Uh, it caused me to double down on my instinct that making it a highly collaborative process is better. Yeah. Makes me better. Makes the film better, you know? I'd seen it, I'd seen it on Dark Angel, I liked it. It seemed like a novel concept, at least from my perspective, to do a feature that way. I was tired of developing features where it's like one script after another, after another comes through the door and then you give notes and it's just, it's horrible. I just, I can't stand that process. I didn't want to do that, you know? Um, and I think it was really fruitful creatively. I really liked it. And my other thought that I'd like to, to leave you with Eric is, in going through down this little memory lane ther therapy session here, I so many moments come to my mind, like Shane expressing an idea or Josh expressing an idea, Amanda, the way Amanda's face would light up with something about character. And I think about the whole story right through to the end, because we know what happens to all these characters. And I cannot fucking wait for the world to see that whole story arc and probably take the rest of my life at the rate we're going but you know we do have a plan but it's you ain't seen nothing yet it's so true that's awesome to hear i we went long but it's an avatar movie so it makes sense yeah. to go a little bit long <laughs> yeah. Um, my name is Eric Davis. I, I would really love to thank our guests, Josh Friedman, Shane Salerno, Rick Jaffa, Amanda Silver, and James Cameron. The film is Avatar, The Way of Water. Uh, thank you so much and congratulations on the film.